Good morning, everyone. Johanna J. Donzi. I want to thank the Doy Drummers. Welcome, everybody, the elders. If there's any chiefs in the room, welcome them. Welcome, everybody, to Treaty 8 territory, shared territory of Fort Nelson, Blueberry, Prophet, Doy, Halfway, Soto, West Bowie, McLeod Lake. I'm not sure if you know what the significance of where we are is, but just down the road here, there's an area called Taylor Flats. And Taylor Flats is the site of an incident that happened a number of years back where 250 to 500 Denizel warriors met the wagon train coming north, stopped it, pushed all the wagons over the hill, and forced the federal government to come up here and start sitting down and negotiate the treaty with the people here. The reason for that is because the people that were moving through the Klondike were destroying camps, stealing horses, doing bad things in the area. And we wanted to end it. We wanted to have some kind of coexistence and sharing between the Klondikers and the people, the respect that should have been given towards the Denizel people who've lived here since time immemorial that was granted to us. So part of my presentation is I want to eat caribou before I die. This was our document that we presented before the courts to show the significance of caribou to the West Wobbly First Nations people. I'm going to kind of set the stage on how Treaty 8 or West Wobbly views the current status of what's going on here. So that area right here, this is a picture of the Graham caribou herd. This right here is the critical wintering habitat of the, of the Graham herd. This is where they go to live um, for the winter. Now, there may be some discussions about how big that area is and how small that area is, but that's, that's primarily where they go. It's windswept, uh, they get up there and they live off the rock lake up there. The Dinizah know that there are caribou here. We have what's called the mountain caribou. We have what's called the boreal caribou. The Dinizah know them as the caribou that are in the mountains, and the caribou that are in the woods, and the caribou that visit back and forth between each other. The prime example of that is the narrow herd, where they don't they move back and forth between each other. So this is sad to say the state of mind of how most people view the caribou or view the animals, is that there's something to move out of the way uh, you know, so we can get at the natural resources. I was looking at the poster up here and I, I'm assuming that's a, an oil derrick rig sitting there. Um, you know, that's one industry, as you heard from Mike the, when he introduced me. We are faced with coal mining. There are five operating coal mines in the territory. There's 235 applications for coal tenure here. There's 147 wind farm investigations. We have two operating wind farms, three to almost uh, the quality wind farm is just getting ready to energize itself. We have two large hydroelectric facilities, a proposed third hydroelectric facility, um, shale gas, conventional oil, conventional gas, the exploration for uh, uh, unconventional oil, shale oil. Uh, we have coal bed methane here. We have thousands of cubits of meat, uh, millions of cubits of meters of uh, wood being harvested uh, every year up here. Treaty 8 territory, most of you have seen my presentation, nothing new, I've added a couple of new slides, I'm going to keep saying it until you guys get it. This is Treaty 8 territory. Our rights expand through the entire territory on that. Um, it's the biggest of the historic treaties and the most comprehensive. These are the oral promises of the treaty. I'm not going to read the whole thing, I'm just going to read a, a part of it uh, that talks here. But over and above the provisions, we had to solemnly assure them that only such laws as to hunting and fishing as were in the interests of the Indians and were necessary in order to protect the fish and fur-bearing animals would be made. They would, they would be free to hunt and fish after the treaty as if they had never entered into it. We assured them that the treaty would not lead to any forced interference. So part of, uh, 
part of what we talk about is the spiritualness of the area. Uh, the image on the left is a pictograph of a caribou located uh, in a zone that was being proposed for a wind farm development. The picture on the right is, a, is an offering site. We had a university, uh, somebody from Drumheller come up and take a look at these things and he said all you need to know is that these are old. These are very old and they should be protected. The caribou, we haven't been able to utilize the caribou because of the we state, uh, the West Wolby First Nations state because of the fighting of the Wilson Reservoir has pushed them into the state that they're in now. We've lost a source of food, source of clothing, arts, tools, elements of the caribou are used for medicine. The habitat, terrestrial and arboreal lichens used as medicine. Tra transmission of knowledge, this is uh, our elder uh, Molly Desiree, she's passed on now, but when she left us, there was encyclopedias of knowledge that went with her, that um, she's transferred to her, to her grandchildren, but you know, there was still stuff that didn't get transferred. Uh, secondary impacts, high interdependence of uh, other species, um, because we are not able to utilize the caribou, we depend on other forms now, uh, moose uh, primary, the elders talk about the caribou as bugs on the landscape. Um, and it was actually recorded in, in Alexander McKenzie when he came through the territory. He said he couldn't believe the vast numbers of animals. The moose here were thick, uh, it looked like a stockyard, and the caribou were like bugs on the landscape. The green is the, the habitat of the, uh, I guess, the northern eco, northern mountain eco types, what the provinces identified them as. Uh, the Peace River is this piece here. This is the Finley River and the Parsnip River. Three main river systems that run through our territory. This was the creation of the Wilson Reservoir that flooded these three rivers and fragmented the caribou migration pattern that moved back and forth through this area. Now there's all kinds of discussion that this never happened. Uh, you know, we know for thousands of years that the caribou moved back and forth. And up until recently, since the flooding of the Wilson Reservoir, have we started noticing the severe declines of uh, caribou habitat and uh, caribou, resulting in this fragmentation of caribou herds. Burnt pine herd, narrowway herd, Scott herd, uh, the Graham herd, BC's uh, and the federal government's world view of things. BC's best management practices are don't re reduce terrestrial lichen ground cover, do not reduce arboreal lichen, do not create disturbances which will dis disturb or displace caribou from the area, and do not improve predator or human access. Canada's Species at Risk document states uh, there was supposed to be a plan in place here in, uh, in 2007. We are just now starting to work on something. Uh, threatened means wildlife species that is likely to become endangered. Um, this is now being upgraded. The caribou here are now uh, listed as endangered. Uh, if nothing is done to reverse these factors, leading to the extirpation, extirpation or extinction. Critical habitat means habitat necessary for the survival or recovery of the listed wildlife species that, and that is identified as a species critical habitat recovery strategy or an action plan for the species. This is probably not new to anybody in this room. So, this is what's happening. Uh, once more we went to court, that was what the uh, Iwani Caribou document is for. I believe we have copies of it in the other room if people want to take it. Um, it costs about $100,000, so just drop a check with me. <laughs> um, this is a, a proposed mine. And it's important to note that this was just exploration here. This is the uh, first coal mine site. Right in the middle of critical wintering habitat of the burnt pine caribou herd. This was the exploration pit that they have dug uh, up there, um, and it was a series of pits that were going to run across the ridge of the mountain, which is where the caribou were. This is the unit that they were going to use. Now, we had no issue with the mining technology that they were going to do, or the mining. We had an issue where this mine was. We didn't want it there. We wanted them to move it. And they argued with us and ignored us. We went to court. Now they don't have a mine. Uh, the court stated that the treaty protects the right 
to exercise meaningfully traditional hunting practices, which means more than merely hunting for food. All you BC people, this is what the court said. As BC contended, we have a treaty right to harvest caribou in accordance to a traditional seasonal realm, meaning uses are protected from forced interference. I conclude that the balance of treaty rights of the native people with the rights of the public generally, including the development of resources of the benefit of the community as a whole, is not achieved if caribou herds in the affected territories are extirpated. Since BC did not meaningfully consult or reasonably accommodate our cultural rights, the permits were suspended for 90 days. The court then ordered them to implement. We tried to get a plan together. We got circumvented by other means and wound up going into a court of appeal here in which it was thrown out. This was a comment on the mitigation plans for the caribou herd. The company put together a mitigation plan. If it was in any other place, it would have been an excellent mitigation plan. But because of the impacts of the herd up here, you can't mitigate the extirpation of caribou. It will directly destroy core wintering range. It also says there is little that they can do about that. It will compromise recovery of the caribou in the area. So we formed what was called a knowledge team. We had our traditional people and the science people together. We put together a report that called for the protection of all the critical habitat, core and high quality habitat. Cabinet decision, they wanted to just shoot all the wolves and reduce the moose populations out there. This is a common view that's out there that we need to shoot all the wolves and shoot all the moose in order to get the caribou back. So we have to make a decision whether we want caribou or moose. They fail to realize that we've always had moose here in populations. This area was burned. Early cereal forests were created, which emulates logging activities, which didn't start until the mid-70s or mid-60s, 50s here on that. The leading caribou biologist in the province said the plan that they put forth is technically impossible to do. They can't do it, but they still put it forth. Bad faith negotiations, we sat at the table in good faith with them. They went and did an end run around us. What you see on the right hand side is an email that was sent to us. There was a discussion going on with the mining company outside of the discussions that we were having at the main table. Talking about don't worry about anything that they have to do or say, we're going to do this. So your rights, your ability to hunt, your ability to mine is going to be protected. Population status threatened caribou herds in the central Rockies. This basically just says that all the caribou herds are declining. There's a couple of them that were stable, but the majority of them have significantly declined. Enough to the state where Sutter has now started the process of relisting them as from threatened to endangered. This is the PJ oil field with the boreal caribou. Everybody in the province that knows anything about caribou knows about this. The oil field, nobody took notice until Doig went forward and brought up a news crew and they did a documentary of the area called Black Blood. It's won a couple of awards now, which is really sad that we had to do something like this in order to bring this to everybody's attention and get them to do something. I understand they've started to clean this up, up there. Is that true? So it took that to get it going. This is the first pipeline rupture that they had in 2000. They had a pipeline rupture in downtown Vancouver and it took them two weeks to clean it up. It's 2012, this line has been in for 12 years and they're just now starting to do something about it. This is the Hackney Hills. This is where a wind farm was being proposed. The image on the right is the Doki wind farm. You can see that the wind farm is right on top of the ridge. This is the windswept ridge, the critical habitat of the Graham caribou herd. You take that development and throw it on top of that, you don't have any more caribou up there. 
this is the first coal site. They accidentally cleared this. They admitted that they accidentally dropped the blade on a D8 cat and ran back and forth about 50 times and cleared off this site. And they made these little trails in the bush that you could barely walk down with a D8 cat. All of this was done without a permit. They were notified twice. The province was notified twice about it. And uh, about this, uh, first coal was in violation twice on this. And the end result of this was out of a $500,000 fine. I believe they've received $65,000 fine on a second term penalty without permits. Current population of caribou, we have 425 caribou left in the South Peace. The one that we thought was stable is the Mowgli, highlighted in red. Uh, it was, at last count, at 190. It's now down to 22. We think there might be even less than that now. Um, we are looking for emergency orders from the province to do something about this. Well, actually, emergency orders from Canada to do something about this. And the burnt pine here is down to one. I don't know how much more it can decline but, uh, before its decline did. The, uh, we sat down just figuring with West Mobley, in order for us to have a sustainable harvest of caribou, uh, we're a small nation, we're the smallest in the Treaty 8 group, we have 250 members, families of five, we figure we have 50 families uh, out there. And in order to harvest two caribou a year, we need 100 caribou. We sat down with uh, some caribou specialists and they figured in order to have a sustainable harvest of uh, 90 caribou a year, we have to have at least 3,000 caribou walking around in all the different herds in order to do this. When we have 50 families, and if we eat two caribou, that's 100. 90 is not going to cut it. That's West Mobley. We have 1,500 First Nations people living in the South Peace Territory. Uh, you can quickly do the math. Caribou aren't that big. Two caribou is relatively easy to eat out there. The status quo for Sarah is to stabilize and maintain. That does not meet the treaty right. We are in violation of a treaty here, and uh, the province and the federal government are supposed to be managing the resources to enable us to have no forced interference with our way of life. This is the Quintet Herd. This is a map we put together. This is a map we've been asking for from the province for years to find out what the cumulative impacts are on the quintet herd. We took all the information, put it together, and we created this map. This is their information, we just put it together. This is what's going on in the quintet herd. This is the only stable herd that we have right now. And there's still development being proposed here. And we're Mickey mousing around with wolf culling programs and, and, and moose culling programs on these for this caribou herd. The blue here is the blue line, it's kind of fuzzy, you can't see it very well, bit of all this stuff. This is oil and gas, forestry, pipeline, wind farms, mining, uh, everything that's going on in there. So this is the end result. Uh, this spring, we found out that one of the caribou, uh, our understanding is that the caribou that have collars on them are female caribou. So this one's not a female, as you can tell. Uh, it's a young bull. It fell off the wall of the pit at first coal. We were told that these caribou need this mine to happen up there in order to protect them. Uh, you can see how they're being protected. The other thing I, I, I've been noticing and the elders have been talking about is no one is seeing large bulls. There's not a picture of a large bull. This is a, 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 a young bull here. But there are no images of large bulls in their territory. Um, I'm hoping that they exist out there and just they're sneaky and no one's you know we get a picture of them. But the large healthy bulls are what keep the herds healthy. The young bulls are not. Um, when breeding season, maintenance season comes around and the rut goes, it's the big bulls that it's the strongest of the, the herds that survive on that. So the genetic material of the caribou herds are being weakened right now. So I'm not sure what my time limit is, but I'm done up here. Uh, we need to step it up. We're doing a piss poor job of taking care of the caribou and balancing 
balancing the economic opportunities with what should be a social responsibility we do not have the right to exploitate caribou out of the area we do not have the right to poison the fish in the rivers we focus a lot about caribou but the mountain sheep and the mountain goat are in the same space the grizzly bear are in being threatened all this stuff is going on while people from other places are filling their pockets off the resources that we have here and like the caribou the first nations are being pushed aside on this so i want to end it with that and i want you all to have this image in your head because this is the image my kids are looking at now